From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And I think I have prepared appropriately for the occasion. I hope you have too. Welcome back. If this is your first time on the Cannabis Podcast, well, we're going to spend the next 30, 40, who knows how many minutes talking about cannabis. It's a plant that I kind of have a love for. And if you have that same fascination with the plant, then you're going to enjoy the ride. On episode 73, we have a couple of perspectives on a big story this week in BC, where the Solicitor General actually took some seized cannabis and gave us the results of some of the testing on that cannabis, and it wasn't all very good. On Cultivar Corner, we have the delightful taste of Green Aid's Quirkle. And Quirkle, quite frankly, is just fun to say. A store owner in Quebec is suing over the ban on cannabis-themed marketing, and we're going to flash back to one of my first cannabis activist moments. All of that and more on Episode 73 of the Cannabis Podcast. And before we get started, once again, a shout out to somebody who popped into the store and mentioned they listened to the Cannabis Podcast. Listened quite a bit, apparently. At least that's what their dad said. Now, unfortunately, I did not get the name. So sorry, dude. But thanks for being a listener to the Cannabis Podcast. It's fun to have you along for the ride. In B.C. this week, the Solicitor General, or my you know, it was the Solicitor General, was making noise, making noise about cannabis in our province. Of course, there has been lots of discussion ever since we had legalization happen in 2018 uh, about the number of stores that were not necessarily licensed. And even forgetting about the gray market stores, we had the legal stores, and then we had the black market. Well, I've got a couple of perspectives on that story this week with the B.C. Solicitor General taking a bunch of samples from some illicit stores in Vancouver, at least we believe that's where most of them came from, and they found all kinds of nasty things like lead and arsenic. And as I said, I have two perspectives. One is from my friend David Wiley at the Okanagan Z, the ounce.ca. Uh, David's perspective, I think, is rather interesting and really sees the story from a BC perspective. And the headline is, B.C. chooses a public relations war over enforcement. Faced with unlicensed cannabis stores all over the province, the B.C. government has opted to wage an optics war. The B.C. NDP's Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General Mike Farnsworth announced this week that cannabis seized from illicit stores contains contaminants not allowed in legal weed, as well as high levels of lead and arsenic. My message to people who choose to consume cannabis is simple. Buy from legal sellers whose regulated product is subject to national requirements that are in place to protect you, says Farnworth in a statement to media. The province says the results show some illicit growers may be engaging in practices that pose risks to both consumers and employees handling cannabis. While the study suggests illicit weed poses a public health risk, the BC NDP announced no action. Officials did not divulge where exactly the cannabis they tested came from other than it came from Metro Vancouver. The BC NDP has been under pressure for more than a year from legal retailers who say they're losing significant business to unlicensed stores. Still, the government has largely ignored or deferred the issue. In the Okanagan, unlicensed stores are open all over the valley on First Nation land. That means they are in the uncharted legal waters of Indigenous rights when it comes to the sale of cannabis. Rather than risking a court battle if they enforce, the province appears to be choosing to play the public safety card. The slow game, however may leave some cash-poor retailers to starve financially as they wait for the government to help them. Some are already on the verge of shutting down. The B.C. Liberal opposition pushed the B.C. NDP on the topic Thursday during committee, as some wondered whether health authorities should step in to close unlicensed stores, and whether the province shares some liability by allowing unlicensed stores to continue operating when there are now documented health risks. The pilot study is a partnership between the B.C. Cannabis Secretariat which is the central coordinating body for non-medical cannabis policy across the provincial government, and the B.C. Centre for Disease Control. Twenty dried cannabis samples that have been seized by the Provincial Community Safety Unit from illicit retailers in the Vancouver area were tested by a federally licensed analytical lab in February 2021. The lab found 24 distinct pesticides, along with unacceptable levels of bacteria, fungi, lead, and arsenic. The National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health also took part in the study, posting about it on their blog. 
they say there were limitations to the study, including it's a small subsample that's not representative of all illicit cannabis in Metro Vancouver. The 20 samples may have been produced by 20 different growers or one. They may have been grown within Metro Vancouver or may have been sourced from elsewhere, says the center. And the center says it focused on flour, adding concentrates made from the bud could theoretically have much higher levels of contaminants after processing. And the bottom line from the province is, buy illicit weed at your own risk. But rest assured, they won't lift a finger to stop it. And that's the perspective from David Wiley, my friend with the Okanagan Z. And now a different perspective on exactly the same story, but this is from CTV News. A new analysis of contamination in cannabis seized from illegal retailers in Metro Vancouver has authorities encouraging consumers to switch to the legal cannabis market. In 20 samples of dried cannabis flour sent for analysis, 24 distinct pesticides were found, with nearly every sample having evidence of at least one potentially harmful product. The public safety minister said the findings lead to a simple conclusion. Legal cannabis, which is regulated and tested by Health Canada, is safer. Don't buy illicit cannabis because you don't know what's in it and it may be contaminated, farmers said. If you choose to use cannabis, buy it legally. According to the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health, only three of the 20 samples would have met health standards for sale on the legal market without further analysis. Nine of the samples failed to meet legal standards outright, while the remaining eight would have required further investigation to determine their suitability for sale through the legal system. The center describes the analysis as a pilot study and notes several limitations on the findings. The small subsample is not representative of all illicit cannabis in Metro Vancouver. And Farworth commented, When you buy from an illicit storefront or an online seller, you don't know where it's coming from or whether it's clean and fit for human consumption. In contrast, when you buy from a licensed seller, you can trust the label on the product. Farmers said a total of 160 illegal cannabis retailers have either been shut down or closed voluntarily in B.C. since legalization, and added that the province is working on further enforcement against the illicit market. With a total of 370 legal cannabis retailers now operating around British Columbia, the idea that the legal market is inconvenient should no longer be an excuse for purchasing cannabis illegally, Farmers said. At the same time, he acknowledged that the transition to a legal cannabis industry has been happening slowly something he attributed, in part, to consumers' entrenched buying habits. It's been legal now in this province for just over two and a half years, Farnsworth said. In the state of Colorado, very similar to British Columbia in many ways, it took four years for them to get from a 100% illegal market to a 70% legal market, and we are on that same path. BC retailers sold about $200 million worth of legal cannabis in March 2020 and sold more than double that amount, $43 million, in March of this year, according to Farnsworth. So there's two perspectives on the B.C. government taking a closer look at some illicit cannabis and giving us some of the results of the investigation of it. <laughs> uh, I don't know if, the, if, if that's really new or, or new or news or anything. I mean, if you talk to a lot of people who were involved in the grow field, they certainly have a commitment and would, would debate and probably say a lot of that was not true in that story that they would qualify, that they checked all their cannabis, but I don't know that they put it to the same level of testing as the companies are now having to go through Health Canada. Interesting perspective on the state of legal cannabis in B.C. And now we go to the gonjapreneur.com site for a story about a head shop owner suing the Quebec government over a cannabis-themed merchandise ban. The owner of a Quebec head shop is suing the provincial government over its ban on selling cannabis-themed products. The ban was established after federal legalization and blocks the sale of any cannabis-related merchandise, including T-shirts and even books. A head shop owner in Quebec, Canada, is suing the provincial government over its ban on cannabis-themed products, arguing that the ban prevents true freedom of expression and that the government hasn't proven the ban is necessary to prevent the public, especially young people, from being harmed, the Canadian press reports. The law bans the sale of cannabis-themed goods, including books, clothing, and other products with cannabis-related images or slogans. Christopher Manillo, the co-owner of Prohibition, a chain of head shops based in the Montreal area, said it doesn't make sense that he had to stop selling cannabis merchandise after 2018's federal legalization of cannabis. He added, he doesn't oppose the provincial ban on cannabis advertising. 
Charles Gravel, the lawyer for the government, argued to the Quebec Superior Court that the ban was necessary to reduce the harmful effects of cannabis use on the public, comparing it to the province's restrictions on tobacco advertising. He contended that the argument the ban infringes on freedom of expression is incorrect because, at the moment, someone who walks in the street with a shirt with a cannabis leaf that says, smoke more, smoke every day, wake and bake, whatever, is in violation of nothing. Gravel argued that even if those shirts are only sold to adults, they would be seen by young people and could encourage youth to use cannabis. The trial concluded on Thursday, and Justice Marc St. Pierre said he planned to deliberate before rendering his decision. That story from T.J. Brandfault at gonjapreneur.com. Interesting that they even had a ban on cannabis themed merchandise. We'd heard about it before. I knew that they couldn't sell anything that even had a cannabis leaf on it. <laughs> Ah, there are so many things about this legislation that just do not make any sense. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner, go to the corner, oh yeah. Go to the corner, please explain this stuff to me. On Cultivar Corner today, we're going to do something that... I should have done it a long time ago. I have found a particular cannabis, a particular strain, a particular cultivar, a particular terpene profile that just really works for me. And I discovered it a few weeks ago, and I have now repeated it with this one particular cultivar many, many times. And for some reason, I kept forgetting to do a cultivar corner and talk about it. I guess because I just was enjoying it so much, I got stoned really fast. I thought, let's rectify that. I have a brand new pack, a brand new eighth of Quirkle from Green Aid. Now, Quirkle, you may ask, what the heck is that? How about Space Queen and Purple Urkel? That's the lineage of Quirkle. And the thing that has astounded me every single time that I have opened up a package, which I will be the first to say are really freaking difficult to open. <laughs> God, cannabis packaging has to get so much better. <laughs> I'm tired of having to leave the store and help somebody open a package because it's just too damn complex. And here I am. <laughs> trying to get a package open so that I can talk about how it smells and okay is that actually open now let's try okay yes and now I just gotta try the opposite action don't try to pull it apart but instead try to go for a diagonal pull and the package should open easier but <laughs> this one isn't I mean, goodness sakes, I'm two minutes into the cultivar corner yet, and I haven't even got the package open. This better be some darn good weed, right? Um, am I going to have to cut it? I'm going to try one other thing. Let's see whether I just, for whatever reason, when I open the package, did I fail to open it properly, or what the... <laughs> I really tried not to swear on this podcast, just... I don't know why, but I'm sure getting close to it now. <laughs> okay, here we go. The magic is going to happen. This package is now going to open. Aha, it did. And there is what I've been waiting for. Oh. If you've listened to the podcast before, you know that I... I have trouble with the nuance of my palate, my, my nasal palate, shall we say, and being able to determine all the particular aromas of a particular cultivar. <clears throat> but I have to tell you, in all honesty, every single time I open a package of Green Aid Quirkle and I stick my nose in it, oh, my body just goes, yes, I want some of that. It is one of the most lovely combination of tastes. And what's creating that combination? It is this. Limonene, linalool, beta-caryophylline, beta-pinene. 
wow, it just, it's just a magic aroma for me. I cannot express how pleasing to my particular nose that particular aroma is. That's the beauty of cannabis, isn't it? You find something that works for you. And now I know that this particular terpene profile, limonene, little little, beta caryophylline and beta pinene, that's my jam. It just, it just does. It makes me stoned. It's what it does. So let me prepare something here. I have, in fact, over the last couple of uh, cultivar corners, I had to stop using the vaporizer because I actually had to send it away. But I do have to give Stores and Bickle credit. Uh, they got that back to me within, geez, within two weeks, I think. Sent a brand new unit. There was a problem with the, um, the USB port that you had to use to charge it up. It seemed a little fragile. This version seems to be a step up and you can actually feel when it's connected now. So I'm hoping that's going to last a little longer, but I digress a little bit. <laughs> but it hasn't been an intentional digression because while I've been speaking about that digression, I have been busy. My fingers have been busy pulling apart some of this bud of this green aid corkle. So, um, yeah, there's some purple notes to it. A really lovely flower and and again astounding one of the astounding things with this one is you get out your jeweler's loop and this is one where the fields of trichomes just go on and on and on and they're big bulbous trichomes lots of amber lots and lots of amber which is not a surprise since this is an indica and it does very indica-like things. We're about to find that out, if I would keep on task. <laughs> I've been working on it. I'm working on it. I've just about got enough to roll myself a nice little joint and to drop some in my brand new refurbished Crafty Plus, where, of course, we're going to get a better taste of the herb. But here's the other really interesting note about Quirkle. Even when I'm smoking it in a joint, it just tastes really good. It, it again, it's that combination of those terpenes, the limonene, the little lul, the beta caryophylline, the beta pinene. I have discovered that that is a terpene profile that speaks to my endocannabinoid system like no other. Oh boy, does it speak loudly to it. And I, it's kind of a joker around the store now whenever our quirkle supply gets a little low people start looking at me and say gary are you are you okay <laughs> say, yeah yeah i'll be fine as long as i got some quirkle it really has become my go-to and there have not been a lot of cultivars over the last two or three years since we hit legalization where i can say i have consistently gone back for them I mean, now some I have gone back for just simply because of cost. They were easily accessible and those kinds of things. But to continually purchase specific cultivar because of its effect and taste for me is a big, big thing. All right, the joint has rolled. Now, let me just get my vaporizer all loaded up so that we can kind of do this in one fell swoop. And the swoop is about to be filled. There we go. I heard a click there and a click here. Here a click, there a click, everywhere a click, click. Once more, the jam for me with Quirkle is, is the distinguished taste. I was going to reference Tangerine Dream, but no, it's not like Tangerine Dream. And, and, and I guess the only reason I reference that is Tangerine Dream had such a unique taste. And so does Quirkle. So I'm ready. <laughs> Let's get at it. Here is Green Aid. Oh, I didn't even tell you what, what the components. We know the terpenes are in it. How much THC is this? This is sitting at 19.7% THC with Green Aid Quirkle. And here we go. Oh, 
and there it is again. Just that that lovely taste. Even when you're smoking it in a joint, you can taste the full feature of this. So there's lots of citrus notes. You know, if they have to put a, a handle on it. I guess there's some peppery notes from the carry off lean and the little little definitely giving it that wonderful floral floral finish, I guess. Mmm. A hint of pine. It's just all of it together. All all four of those in a I wish they had the percentages on here. Because I'd love to know how what the percentage of all of those lovely terpenes it is that kicks me, that kicks me in the butt. So, just re relit the joint because I didn't take enough of a hit off of it to keep it going. I have corrected that issue now. And the other thing that has hit me with Quirkle every single time that I have used it, <laughs> and I am very pleased to tell you this is no exception. And that is within just a couple of hits. I'm feeling my happy eyes. I'm feeling euphoria. <laughs> I'm feeling that this is going to evolve into a very nice body stone. And that's going to eventually evolve into a very beautiful sleep at the end of the night. But right now, <laughs> it means I got stoned really fast. And it's done it for me every single time. <laughs> even even in between some of the really high THC stuff that I've been sampling of late and, and putting that aside. And then I get back to Quirkle. And let's remind you of, again, what the THC content of the Quirkle is. And the THC is 19.7%. Uh, but that terpene profile... The limonene, little little beta caryophylline, beta pinene. Like right now, I just got a rush. I haven't had, I haven't had a stoner's rush in a long, long time. And, and I just did, and that's like after three hits of the joint. So now, just to finish this off and and put a final um, stone in it, so to speak, uh, I'm firing up the vaporizer, and I'm going to take the enthusiasm of the stone that I am currently enjoying. And take that to one further step. And that final step is to now taste it through the vaporizer and really taste Green Aid Quirkle. Wow. Hmm. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Now, of course, the thing to remember with the vaporizer is individually you have to play with the temperature to see what's right for you with a particular cultivar i think i might have this one a little too hot i was smoking something else in it earlier this afternoon i'm gonna bring that down a little bit because i want to i want to taste more of the flavor and that's the one thing with the vaporizer that you're using the higher the temperature generally speaking the hotter it's going to burn and, and the less flavorful it's going to be so now i've turned this down to well, five or six degrees lower. <laughs> Let's see what the taste is. See, I, I'm pretty high right now. I'm just kind of adding to it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I am glad I adjusted the temperature. Because now, oh... The little, little the, that floral note is really the finishing tone on that, but there's some citrus. Mm. The four of them just, and I know there's other terpenes in there. I know we're talking about just the main four terpenes that are, that are involved, but my goodness sakes, they do a marvelous job. They taste absolutely fabulous. They get me so high each and every single time that I have smoked this cultivar. So if you have not tried it yet, what are you waiting for? From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. 
You know, there is a danger when you base a podcast on cannabis, that as you tell some stories, there may come a moment where you repeat yourself. Now, this may be one of those moments, or it may not be. (laughs) Because that's one of the other factors when you have a podcast that's based around the theme of cannabis, that you may not write things down. You may not keep a record of everything that you've talked about, which would be a really smart thing to do. Now, (laughs) it's not that I have absolutely no notes on anything that has occurred over the course of this podcast so far, but it seems I've neglected to build myself a database of these stories that I may or may not have told. So if this is a repeat, I hope it's a better telling than it was the first time. If this isn't a repeat, well, then I hope you enjoy the story. This is back when I first became passionate about being a proponent of cannabis. And it was at that moment, and I I was probably, well, I won't put an age on it because I do want to clarify one thing. Anything that I talk about on this podcast, I'm assuming that anybody involved is 19 years of age or the age of a majority in the jurisdiction you are living in. I'm not purporting any use of cannabis for anyone under the age of 19 However, the story might have taken place when I wasn't quite 19. I believe, in fact, I was probably 17. But then cannabis was illegal at that time, so it was no more illegal for me to have smoked it at 17 than if I was 19. You have to put things into perspective. Again, it was about that time in my life when I decided that I'm not going to hide it. Yeah, I'm going to be a proponent for cannabis because I like what it does, I mean, we we hardly knew anything about the plant then, but but I knew that there was a future in it, and I wanted to be part of that future. So I chose to be pretty vocal about whether I smoked cannabis and, and, and my thoughts on it. In the town I was living in at that time, there was a, a real movement, uh, I think parental-driven, to you know, put down any use of cannabis or, or, or anything like that. They, of course, you know, consumed, considered it to be the same as heroin. After all, it was a Schedule One drug, right? They, the government was leading them down that path. Can't necessarily blame them for that. But I felt I needed to get out there and put the proper perspective, or at least the perspective as I knew it, into someone else's face. So I did that a few times. And, and this was two of those, those times. There was a parent meeting that was called at the local high school. And it was organized, well, I don't know who, yes, I do. It was one of the parent action committees at the time. They organized it, and and they had an RCMP officer there to speak, and they had a couple of other people talking about the dangers of drugs and, and, and all of the evils associated to it. And I decided that it would be a cool idea to go along to this meeting. And I thought it would be an even cooler idea to smoke a joint before I went into the meeting. Because if I'm going to go into a meeting that's going to talk about the the dangers of, of cannabis and the evils. Remember back then, reefer madness was still in people's memory and, and they thought that weed instantly made you insane. <laughs> no, 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 I, I'm not insane. I just thought I had to do a reality check there. <laughs> so I went into the meeting, uh, smoked a, a doobie or two prior to going in and participated in the discussion. And it, it was as I expected negative, negative, negative. There, there, there's nothing that cannabis can do that's that's going to be good for you. And and it was all about the evils of cannabis and how this was going to affect the, the, the entire generation effect that was going to be destroyed by cannabis introduction. Well, after this had been going on for about 25, 30 minutes, I, I stood up and I said, well, I have a perspective that I think will give you a different perspective. I have been stoned on cannabis the entire time we've been having this discussion. The room went silent for a moment. <laughs> I looked around and I saw some aghast faces on some of these parents. The RCMP officer didn't look terribly impressed either. And in fact, it looked like he was one to throw me up against the wall and see if I was carrying anything. <laughs> he didn't, though, to his, to his credit. And, but it did what I wanted it to do. It sparked their minds to think maybe there is a different perspective that, that, that we we haven't seen before. Now, did I change their mind? No, probably not because I was a long-haired hippie and they didn't really care what a long-haired hippie was stoned on marijuana thought. 
but I hope I at least presented to them the fact that I could have an intelligent conversation and participate in society while high on cannabis without jumping out of a window and and declaring my insanity. (laughs) So that was one. The second one was, I think, organized by the same group, only this time they took it a step further. There was an RCMP officer, again involved in, in the demonstration, and they were trying to show the parents what the smell was, and especially the smell of hashish. So this time it wasn't just myself. <laughs> there was a couple of us who decided to go to this event and, and again participate. Now, did we smoke a joint beforehand? Probably. Can't honestly remember, but that's irrelevant based on how the story goes. <laughs> so a similar similar story, similar discussion, group of parents all talking about the, the evils of cannabis and marijuana and the RCMP up on stage saying, well, now you'll know what to, what to smell for and, and know the evils that are happening. <laughs> and we got in line as the RCMP officer lit a fairly significant chunk of hashish so that it was now burning on the end of a pin and parents were going up and taking a smell of that. And, <laughs> and yes, we did. We got right in line with those parents and and I stood there in front of that officer and... <sighs> oh, that's what it smells like. <laughs> and there wasn't a darn thing you could do about it. <laughs> I know it's a little infantile to get quite that much fun out of it, but it was still fun nonetheless. And so there you go. There's my first two incidences of of first cannabis activism, uh, taking this plant seriously and passionately and loving the effect it has. And as I've said many times on this podcast and at other times in my life, I love being stoned. And as usual, all of the links to anything talked about today on the Cannabis Podcast you will find at CannabisPodcast.com. Sign up for the newsletter. You'll never miss an episode. And if you ever have anything you'd like to comment on, please send that to info at CannabisPodcast.com. That wraps it up for Episode 73 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley... This was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. I'm Larry Mishkin, and I'd like to invite you to join Rob Hunt and me on our weekly podcast, The Deadhead Cannabis Show. Each week, we explore the latest cannabis and jam band news and reminisce with other deadheads and jam band lovers about the great musical acts that we've seen and heard. Check out a new episode every Monday.